Uh, right, next is the final section that we have today. We have uh, the pleasure to have invited Dr. Tristram Hunt, director of um, Dublin uh, VNA Museum. Thank you very much. Please uh, be seated off stage. We're going to be connecting with um, Dr. Hunt while we are getting ready. Let me um, introduce um, our guest. Dr. Hunt is the director of the VNA, Victoria and Albert Museum. Since taking up the post in 2017, Dr. Hunt has championed design education in UK schools and encouraged debate around the history of museums' global collections and overseen the transition to multi-site museum. You can find out um, from him what multi-site museum is all about. We also have um, Mr. Yu as the moderator. Albertopolis updated exploration of how Victorian and Albert's museum's founding mission continues to speak to education, regeneration, and urban culture today. Over to you, Dr. Hunt. Hello, my name is Tristram Hunt. I'm the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And it's a pleasure to be connected with all of you today at the Jockey Club Intangible Cultural Heritage and Innovative Heritage Education Programme 2021 Summit. And an honour to have been invited to speak at the closing plenary, Relationship Between Arts and Cultural Living. Whilst very sadly, I cannot be in Hong Kong today to deliver this lecture in person. We are lucky at the VNA to have ways to transport us to your wonderful city. The watercolour on the left shows Hong Kong Harbour around 1850. There's Hong Kong Island to the left of the picture and the unseen Kowloon Peninsula. In a more contemporary vein, the image on the right is part of a series called Subdivided Flats by the photographer Benny Lam, documenting overcrowded living situations in Hong Kong and it was shortlisted for the pre Pictet Photography Prize in 2017 hosted here at the VNA in our Porter Gallery. Today we are greatly looking forward to working with M Plus and the Kowloon Cultural District, learning from each other how to develop a relationship between arts and cultural engagement to show why arts, culture and design matter at the scales of both local development and global interaction. Not least because today the VNA is heavily invested in the Pearl River Delta cultural agenda through our ongoing presence and collaboration 
with the Design Society in Sheku, Shenzhen. The v &A Gallery of Design Society in Shenzhen opened in 2017 and has since received 1.4 million visitors. Touring exhibitions and loans activity play a major role in this international engagement. The v &A's travelling exhibition, Fashion from Nature, opened in Shenzhen at the end of 2020 with a special new section, Fashioned from Nature in China, Then and Now. The exhibition presents nearly 400 garments and accessories from the 3rd century BC to the present day, including precious objects from the v &A shown in China for the very first time. It celebrates the ways in which nature's immense beauty and power has inspired fashion over the past 400 years. At a time when we are increasingly scrutinising fashion's material impact on the natural world, fashion from nature provides an opportune moment to investigate the often devastating effects of fashion production on Earth's flora, fauna and human communities and puts the question of fashion sustainability in a historic context. My message to you today is to explore how the Victoria and Albert Museum's founding mission continues to speak to education, to regeneration and to urban culture in the 21st century. The museum's first director, Henry Cole, famously described the v &A as, quote, like a book, always open and never shut. In his first report to the Department of Science and Art in 1853, he also stated that by proper arrangement, a museum may be the highest degree instructional and impressive schoolroom for everyone. Cole believed that the power of the museum to link industry and manufacturing, learning and creativity was a potent combination for positive urban transformation at a period when Britain's cities were growing at an exponential rate. And today, we still firmly believe in that mission. The v &A emerged from the legacy of the first truly international exhibition of design, art and manufacture, the Great Exhibition of 1851 drawing together the wealth of nations from 32 countries, more than 100,000 products were put on display in a wonderful collision of consumerism and domesticity, the precursor in many ways to our modern day department store. The government authorised a substantial budget for the purchase of manufacturing items from the exhibition for the new schools of design. The bedrock collection of this exhibition formed the first Museum of Manufacture, and that was the earliest iteration of the V&A flowing out from that exhibition. The new museum was pioneering, the first devoted to decorative, applied or industrial art, and from the very beginning, education, education for the designer and the manufacturer was at the very heart of the museum's purpose. The profits from the Great Exhibition allowed our founder, Prince Albert, to establish a permanent legacy. To the south of Kensington Palace, in what developers termed South Kensington, Albert initiated London's first cultural quarter, Albertopolis. And at the very heart of Albertopolis was the Museum of Manufacture, which became the South Kensington Museum and later the v &A. Our founding destiny was, quote, to become the central storehouse or treasury of science and art for the use of the whole kingdom. The new museum was the meeting place of art, design, education and commerce and by 1870 was attracting 1.2 million visitors a year. A founding inspiration for the v &A was the importance of using these collections to teach design education instruction and education, always a key component of what we do here. We were part in many ways of the Mechanics Institute movement, this great democratisation of teaching design in the mid-19th century. 
really because of fears over the poor quality of British design relative to European competitors, which led to the rethinking of art education from first principles. Rather than just fine art, Britain needed an education system which supported industrial design. And the South Kensington Museum was to act as the, the hub, the heart of this design school movement, training teachers, reforming curriculum, and lending its collections across the country. Today, our collections span over 5,000 years in virtually every medium, the historic sitting comfortably alongside the contemporary. As a museum established by a continental prince with an initial collection drawn from South Asia and with particular strengths in Islamic art, this is a museum that could never simply be limited to the British Isles. So pictured here are some of the v and South and Southeast Asia gallery collections covering the Indian subcontinent south of the Himalayas, including India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Afghanistan. Then the Titi Choi Gallery, housing one of the most comprehensive and important collections of Chinese art outside East Asia. The Toshiba Gallery of Japanese art, displaying some 550 highlights from our 48,000 objects of Japanese heritage. And then the Jamil Gallery of Islamic Art, opened to widespread acclaim in 2006. As a museum born of the imperial moment in the mid 19th century, the v and collections have an intimate connection to the history of the British Empire. This included significant cultural riches extracted by the East India Company from colonial India and elsewhere. But the collections also include a wealth of objects purchased by the museum's curators who look to markets abroad for wonderful items from across Europe, Latin America, East Asia, the Middle East and North Africa. These diverse collections played a significant role in bringing global art to the attention of designers, manufacturers and the public in 19th century Britain. Today, we are working hard to interrogate and open up the v and colonial past. The challenge is to contextualise the collections, understand them and, in time, share them. Until recently, the often violent histories of these colonial era objects were rarely acknowledged at the v &A. Museum labelling traditionally foregrounded design history, craftsmanship, materiality, creative influence. But we must appreciate that the loss through appropriation and looting of cultural heritage is a live and highly contentious issue because of its long felt impact on identity, cultural practice, memory and creative lineage. As one repository of this colonial expropriation, we have an obligation to think about new collaborative pathways forwards. This vital process started recently with the Magdala 1868 display in 2018, which explored the 1868 battle at the Magdala Fortress in Ethiopia. This in many ways was the culmination of the so-called Abyssinian expedition to release British hostages held by Emperor Teodros II. The British army defeated the Emperor's forces and then ransacked the fortress at Magdala before the troops carted away huge amounts of looted treasure back to the UK. A number of these objects are now held across several British cultural collections. This crown and chalice have been on display at the v &A for over 145 years. But the circumstances of their seizure and the consequences deserve to be much better known. So to mark the 150th anniversary of the Siege and Battle of Magdala, we opened this free display of these important objects that span textiles, photography and metalwork. The display aimed to more successfully place these objects in context by focusing on the run-up to the battle and its controversial aftermath. We sought to tell a similar story with our recent Ashanti Gold collections, looking at the culture of imperial trophy hunting behind them. Last year, 
we opened a new display of Ashanti gold weights from Ghana. Objects seized during the third Anglo-Ashanti War of 1874. As the v &A curator, Angus Patterson, explains, the gold was not taken simply for its financial value. By removing the regalia from the Ashanti court, Britain had stripped the Ashanti rulers of their symbols of government and denied them their authority to govern. Whilst historically these items might have been presented primarily as a source of inspiration for design students and goldsmiths, we now explain their place within the ugly history of imperial trophy hunting and inevitably how the South Kensington Museum was enveloped in such exercises of colonial violence. In time, we hope to share these items far more equitably with museums and cultural institutions in modern Ghana. Our challenge at the V&A is to ensure we also use this moment to extend our breadth of connection with museums, galleries, designers and makers across the whole continent of Africa, traditionally underrepresented within our often Eurocentric collections. This material omission of such a significant source of global creativity necessarily distorts how we are able to curate and in turn the public appreciate questions of influence, appropriation, even quote unquote civilization. Today the V&A is a museum that encompasses many things a world-class collection of over 2.7 million objects, an international centre of excellence for pioneering curatorship, conservation and research, a place for brilliant and thought-provoking exhibitions, displays and events, and a natural home for art and design education. From displays such as Blanc de Chine, a continuous conversation in 2020, showing the connections between contemporary and historic white porcelain made in Doha, a thriving porcelain town that still boasts industrial success as well as artistic creativity. To installations such as Zhu Bing's Travelling to the Wonderland, inspired by a classic Chinese fable, the Peach Blossom Spring, put on display in the V&A's Majeski Garden at the heart of the museum. These are just two examples of how we work at the V&A in trying to blend historicism and contemporary cultures across architecture, collections, programmes and curations. It is our educational ethos in particular that is an essential part of the V&A founding mission that continues to be at the forefront of our activities today. To our minds, a museum like the V&A, as I explained, born of that design school moment in the mid-19th century continues to have that powerful responsibility to promote design and creativity in our education system. Recent years in the UK have seen a really worrying fall in creative education in our school system and this is particularly the case in disadvantaged communities where art and design and drama and music is often being stripped out of the school day. So we wanted to make a difference. We thought we needed to act uh, and begin to reverse uh, that fall in creative education. And we began a programme called v &A Innovate for schools in England to meet the needs of teachers and young people keen to retain a creative part of their schooling. We offer support to every secondary school in England with a focus on young people and how they can think about real world issues through the prism of design principles which are used in industry to inspire the creatives and the designers of tomorrow. A suite of online free classroom resources, videos with designers and continuing professional development modules complements a national school's challenge to spotlight inspiring projects and we've been delighted uh, by how many schools have wanted to participate in this. v &A Innovate forms just one part of an ambitious agenda to remain true to the founding principles of the v &A as a book that is always open 
and never shut, for students and practitioners alike. A second major area in terms of young people in education is our flagship redevelopment project at the V&A Museum of Childhood in East London, which we plan to reopen in 2023 with a new mission focused on supporting the creative potential for children, families and young people. Our ambition is to use this wonderful space with new galleries focused on design and imagination and play to ensure that the V&A is a national incubator for creativity and the new soft creative skills that young people need. This is a major part of our ambitious plan to return the lifeblood of creativity in teaching, reshape the future of museum learning and inspire the next generation. So we're involved in this big project of reimagining how we share the Museum of Childhood's world-class collection, exploring pioneering methods of digital interpretation, co-curated spaces and children and how we have creative exploration through play, the power of play and what that does to young minds. So you can see some of our recent acquisitions here. They've included a pair of Child's Yeezy Boost 350 Glow Trainers designed by Kanye West for Adidas, which are going to be destined for the Museum of Childhood's new Imagine Gallery. As a historian, I believe that processes of exchange and adaptation collectively mould our experience of a place's heritage and, in turn, transform the culture, economy and identity of that place. The history of Hong Kong, of course, is this wonderful story of different cultures and communities coming together over centuries, speaking to this great story of exchange and adaptation and interaction. As I'm sure we'll see, with the burgeoning new cultural hubs like West Kowloon, there remain important lessons to be learned from successful museums and commercial attractions and their role in bringing cultural regeneration to often underserved areas. To my mind, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, still remains the clearest example of culture-led urban and regional regeneration schemes. Since opening in 1997, the Guggenheim has helped to revitalise Bilbao's economy with visitor numbers regularly topping one million a year. Bilbao was certainly a driving force in terms of bringing in international investment and regional regeneration uh, to Spain. And 20 years on, this template still stands. It was certainly an inspiration for us at the V&A when we were thinking about our new museum in Scotland, V&A Dundee. Uh, this has proved an enormous success since it's opened uh, over 18 months ago, bringing in new investment into the city, some £75 million economic impact across Scotland, new hotels, new businesses and, crucially, new jobs in both Dundee and across Scotland. Today's museums are highly successful economic drivers, providing financial benefits that ripple through the economy. And in managing this complex balance between business and culture, our 21st century museums are setting the framework for the future of the institution, which sits at this intersection between heritage and innovation, historicism and modernity. We believe that to build a successful heritage museum in today's world requires a fine balancing of history and accessibility. And it is a determination to open up the V&A to as wide an audience as possible, which has driven our ambitions to create a new museum in East London on the Olympic Park. Our plan here is to build a new waterfront museum focused on the practices of making, the story of making, in the heart of East London, we will tell a story of making and designing through the V&A collections, which speaks to this part of London, stretching right back to the Huguenot silk weavers and furniture makers of the 1700s, the bow potters of the 1800s, the plastic innovators, through to today's designer makers, fashionistas, coders and grime artists. Nearby, our interconnected collections and research centre will open up the V&A reserve collections, our storage facility, as never before. Rebuilding historic rooms, 
resurfacing abandoned objects, bringing constellations of ideas and objects together. v &A East is an investment in creativity, collaboration and opportunity. We will embrace great creative practice, no matter where it came from. These are all qualities that are threaded throughout V&A history, the principles which V&A East will be built on, recasting the founding vision for a younger and more diverse audience than any museum before, and remaking aspirations for the digitally native and for a rapidly changing art sector. To my mind, it is the true spirit of the founding mission of the V&A as a force for urban transformation, cultural regeneration, updated for the 21st century. Albertopolis taken to new audiences in new ways. Now, a year ago, museums all over the world, the V&A included, had never been more popular, with record-breaking visitor numbers, new museum campuses, blockbuster exhibitions crisscrossing the globe. In unprecedented territory, though, we all then faced the terror and the horror of the pandemic. And the V&A, with many thousands of other cultural institutions around the world, was forced to close its doors in March 2020 as part of the fight against the pandemic. It's been a difficult and challenging year. We've opened and we've closed. We've reopened again. And on May the 19th, uh, audiences and visitors were welcomed back to our site at South Kensington. As confidence increases, capacity will slowly be expanded. However, it does remain uncertain what visitor demand and market recovery will look like in the coming months and indeed years. Contemporary museums have assumed a formidable range of functions, adapting to offer their public more than ever before. For their own long-term viability, in our post-COVID world more than ever, Museums are having to change to meet the needs and wants of the next generation. The pressures and expectations placed on museums to make their collections more available to more people, to increase the numbers and diversity of their audiences, to widen public access and social inclusion, to engage more fully with their communities, to improve health and well-being, to contribute to placemaking and to promote national interests and influence overseas. You put all that together and the demand on museums has never been greater or more insistent. The pandemic, I think, has revealed the strength of museums as spaces in our communities, as vital tools of civic coming together. In an era of social media fear and distrust, the validity and desirability of the museum has increased. But the pandemic has also revealed the real fragility of the museum ecosystem. The reliance on the physical presence of visitors as the primary income stream carries enormous risk. COVID has also challenged us to think in new and different ways, putting our content online, such as this meeting, and in the process, being able to connect with many thousands of people from a much wider geographic circle. The pandemic has shown how digital content can enhance how we experience museums. During lockdown, most have been forced to innovate and accelerate their digital expansion. According to the International Council of Museums, or ICOM, half of global museums increased social media activity and one-fifth increased online access to collections, events and learning. At the V&A, lockdown-born digital content included our immensely popular behind-the-scenes look at our uh, uh, Kimono Kyoto to Catwalk exhibition with a YouTube film and our inclusion as the first overseas museum on China's leading video sharing mobile platform, Kwashu, enabling virtual tours of the VNA. As museums tackle momentous challenges on the path to recovery, there's great opportunity to fashion a new kind of hybrid museum that maximizes these digital offerings whilst rebuilding our physical sites of communal experience. It expands public understanding of museums' broader role in society and the challenges that come with that. Here's a good example. The V&A's digital content on the Raphael cartoons 
released online ahead of the refurbished Raphael Court reopening after lockdown lifted. Through interactive features, audiences could explore the monumental Renaissance works by zooming in to ultra-high resolution photography, infrared imagery and 3D scans of the cartoons. This is the first time that audiences have been able to explore these masterpieces of the High Renaissance in such detail. And now we have the museum open and the public will want to come and see the experience of these cartoons for themselves in the court. The importance of a physical encounter in the museum, that conversation between objects and people remains unrivaled. For many, there's no greater sense of experience above and beyond the wonder and potency of viewing tangible collections for themselves, especially now. With such limitations on our personal movements and associations, we've come to understand just how significant museums are as physical sites of community and convergence. At the v as we think about the future of the museum, we need to update Albertopolis. We need to appreciate our original purpose, our civic role, our educational mission, our democratic ethos, our curatorial prowess, and retool that for the 21st century. That is what we're embarking on here at South Kensington. I do hope in time you can come and see it for yourselves. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. Uh, we now have Dr. Hunt and also Louis Yu, our principal of uh, Hong Kong Art School, to have this section of Q&A. And may I ask the floor audience or the audience online, please, you're most welcome to leave your comment and question, and we'll facilitate that. So the time now to Louis and Tristram. Dr. Hunt, good morning. Good morning. Happy to see you. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this, uh, this afternoon in uh, Hong Kong time uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic situation. Unfortunately, uh, just last night or two days ago, Hong Kong government has uh, stopped all direct flight from Hong Kong to UK because of the, what is it now, Delta, uh, version of the of the pandemic situation but luckily luckily we can see you clearly here it's a, it's a great privilege to be with you and i'm very very sorry that i can't be with you uh in person i i always love visiting uh hong kong and working with colleagues in the museum sector and university sector and art sector um in, in such an important cultural space uh, around the world but we are we are all separated by this wretched pandemic uh at the moment so um i'm, I'm very glad we can at least have the conversation virtually yeah so um uh, and i i love the vna museum a lot and uh, your museum is one of my favorite uh, museum and the ticket is so difficult to get sometimes well, we, it's busy. We're, we're, we're a busy uh, museum, but um, normally there's, I find normally there's a, there's a way to get through on the day. So, do, so don't always think when it says sold out, it's sold out. There's, there's, always, there's always a little bit of wiggle room on the day, I think. Okay, let me tell you a little bit context about uh, the conference we have here uh, today. Um, in Hong Kong here. Uh, we are talking about um, how do we say uh, cope with uh, the intangible cultural heritage issue here. Uh, as you know that uh, since the year 2003, the UNESCO has uh, started uh, this, um, uh, the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage uh, conven convention. And since then, a lot of country uh, in the world have, say, stepped into the preservation of intangible cultural heritage. Um, since the VNA Museum is one of the greatest museums in the world in collecting objects. And, I, and you just uh, mentioned about the future of museum in your 
in the lecture. You just did it in your lecture about the future of museum. I just want to ask you, as the director of the VNA Museum, how do you see the VNA Museum in the future, say, uh, starting to collect or starting to keep, uh, apart from the tangible, uh, the object? version of human, say, cultural um, uh, uh, practices. Uh, do you see the muse museum has a role in collecting or keeping or safeguarding intangible cultural heritage? That, that's a great question. And, and you're right, when, when you look at the museum, it's a, it's a collection of objects and we, and we catalog objects. Yet we've always had this very interesting role of supporting designers and makers. Our, uh, as I said, our, the first name for the museum was the Museum of Manufactures. And so even whilst we, we end up with the objects, behind that is an extraordinary cultural and social and creative history of making and designing, a much more intangible history, which finds its tangible form um, in the object. So today, we, we, we are interested not only in supporting uh, a new generation of ceramicists, uh, glass blowers, uh, weavers, textile designers uh, through the museum. We help uh, our collection is, is a way, in a sense, to inspire them to think about their own practice um, and making. But we also now use all of the tools that we, we've come to know in terms of uh, digital recording in terms of uh, capturing oral histories and cultural histories connected to the practice of making. So we're going wider in a sense um, in, in, in terms of how we end up with the object by capturing some of that intangible heritage, some of that practice of making and designing and producing, which then ultimately ends up with the collection. Yes, uh, as you mentioned in the lecture you just gave to us, you um, mentioned about the importance in, say, shows showing uh, the context um, in the exhibition, not only the object, but the historical and, uh, and other social context in the making of that object and the collection of that, uh, of that object. Is that what you mean by in the future of the museum practices, uh, how, to in, how to keep and how to highlight the intangible cultural heritage surrounding the, the object or, or exhibit? Very much so. Um, and uh, again, if you look at one of our upcoming developments, which is going to be in the uh, east end of London, on the, where the, uh, the 2012 Olympics um, took place on the Olympic Park, what we're building there is a collections and research centre. Um, so this facility, which will hold our reserve storage collection, but we're doing it in a part of London which is renowned for its culture of studios, uh, 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 craft places, design shops, uh, workshops. And we're, we're very much thinking, well, how can the museum support that, that, that culture of making and designing? So our next steps are, in a sense, moving away from some of the, uh, the, the kind of heavily curated high-end gallery infrastructure to think about how we use our collections in a uh, more kind of grounded, um, tangible way to connect to the intangible cultures of making and designing today. And so it's this, it's this interesting role that museums as these great sort of resources of material products help today uh, the makers and designers of tomorrow. And that's what we're seeking to do in the East End of London, which, as you know, right since the arrival of the French Huguenots back in the 1600s, the silk weavers, the furniture makers, uh, the potters, has been this great area of production in London. But this is interesting because in your lecture you mentioned that uh, in the early days of the uh, VNA Museum, one of the mission was to 
uh, help the designers and train the designer and and how to uh, uh, make sure the design uh, of the life uh, in in the United Kingdom flourish at that time. So, in the future, in your new museum, you are going to invest more into the connection with the designers community. Yes, I. And, and, and I, th I think the difference between now and the origins of the V&A is that um, in those days, in the 1850s and 1860s, it was in a sense focused almost on mass production. So how do we help the great ceramic houses of Minton and Wedgwood? How do we help the steel industry? How do we uh, help the textile industry, the kind of big global production basis of the, of the industrial revolution? And now, um, in today's world, we're much more focused on the individual creative, on the workshop, on the studio, on, on the craftspeople. And that's an interesting shift. We're, we're not, in a sense, here so much to help um, the, the, the kind of big volume manufacturers. We're more about helping through our collection um, the cutting edge uh, photographers, fashion designers, uh, craftspeople. And so that's, I suppose, one of the, the different dynamics between now and then. Okay, the makers of the day. Uh, exactly. May, may I open the, the Q&A section to the floor? Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Hello. Hunt. Um, because uh, I know you're, you were the um, politician before. And then you ch change uh, your position, and then you you choose to be a VNA director. That time you mentioned only art educations can make the city greater. Uh, that is uh, what I what I read, and then it's so impressive for me. And then um, for today, when you mention about you know uh, a lot about designer and the uh, craft and uh, also the role of the museum. And I'm curious about what do you think about the role of the art education? What is the role of, um, of an artist? Because you mentioned a lot about the industry, about the design. How about art and artists and art education? I, I, I think art education is absolutely vital and, and uh, you, you saw on that slide one of the challenges we face within uh, Britain today is that the fall in the number of young people taking art, design, drama, music, the creative subjects. When we know that in the, the fourth industrial revolution, the changes that are ripping through our economies, we need creativity. Um, people are going to go through numerous jobs in their lives. They're going to have to be resilient. They're going to have to be creative. And the, the, the discipline that art teaches, uh, the way in which your brain works in manners which a robot cannot compete with, is enormously important for their future. So there is a, um, a kind of um, a moral case for teaching young people about the wonder of art and encouraging them to be creative. And then there's quite a clear-headed economic case, which is that for a competitive, successful, creative economy, you need uh, a, a broad education system. And what we continually struggle with against in, in, in Britain is, is the kind of tyranny of STEM, that it can only be science and technology and engineering and maths that will give you the, the workforce of the future. Uh, and, and what I argue with other colleagues is that you need a, 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 a very liberal arts education uh, and a strong grounding in creativity to have those soft skills, to have those executive skills that will sustain your career into the future. So there's both a moral uh, and quite a hard-headed economic case for it. Okay, any more question? Hi. Uh, Dr. Hans, um, thank you very much uh, for the talk. I really like VNA. Uh, my last visit to VNA was the 2017 one when I first visited the Pink Floyd exhibition. That was my first time to listen and see their work. And then after the whole exhibition, I became their fans. Um, that's why I always, that, that, that's one of the first time I really think about curatorial and education and and especially the end bit where everyone's sitting in the concert and listening to their music, something 
so far away, suddenly it becomes so tangible. Um, I really want to know uh, how you pick your topics for like every year and how long was the preparation for like such um, exhibition and how many parties were involved and stuff like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, so exhibitions are a big part of, of the V&A, more, more so than many other museums. And we've been doing exhibitions since the early 1860s. So it's something we, we enjoy doing. Um, and we have a cycle of, of kind of pitches that, that curators will come along with ideas and there'll be an initial um, sort of, you know, yes or no, whether there's some enthusiasm for it or not. Uh, and then it'll go through a number of uh, quite rigorous uh, questions about, you know, why, why should this take place? Why should it take place at the VNA? What are the, what's the cultural benefit? What's the economic benefit? Those questions. Um, and it will normally take around three years between um, the, the, the kind of initial conception of it uh, and if it's successful, it then landing um, in the museum. Uh, and that's because obviously we want a publication with it. We want it to be scholarly and serious. Uh, we want to have access to all the relevant archival materials. Um, and we also normally have lots of international lenders where, where, the, where the timetables are very long. So it's a, it's a three year process which brings in everyone across the museum, marketing, development, conservation, curatorial uh, directorate. Um, and for us, what's so important is it also secures membership that for, for our economic model, we need lots of members uh, to become part of the VNA and become supporters um, of the VNA. So I'm so glad you enjoyed the Pink Floyd uh, exhibition. It was a, it was a great success. Um, it, it, it did very well in London um, and actually made us, as it should do, think again about the role of that band uh, within British culture and pop culture uh, right around the world. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Han. And uh, this is a very, very interesting um, session. And thank you for the wonderful talk. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Come to wait. Ah, you're saying Lewis. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, please uh, proceed off stage. After this uh, very interesting. Uh, lecture. We're coming to the end of the um, summit. There are a couple of messages I'd like to uh, bring home today. Uh, this uh, summit uh, may be coming to an end, but still there are a whole host of other programs that we are really dearly wanted to uh, take part and experience. We have uh, so many exhibitions. K11 Art Mall in Jim Zhaojui East. Um, we have these uh, 2021 annual showcase uh, till the 4th of July. If you haven't been, please make it snappy. Um, this is going to end uh, by the end of this week. Tomorrow uh, is the deadline uh, on 10th floor of this um, art center. While you are here, why don't you uh, pop up there and have a look. On 10th floor, the exhibition is about um, six artists. Uh, in the context of ICH, if you are busy, I know you're very tired today, and you might wish to go online uh, to the art shop and to, to um, enjoy their uh, works, and you can also uh, buy their products. I'd like to make an appeal uh, for those who are online and also uh, everyone here in this um, audience. You stay so far, and I get the feeling that you find this um, summit very fruitful, and uh, you might wish to share with us uh, your input. Those who are online, and there must be a button on your um, screen, a survey or questionnaire, then press the button and uh, fill in the questionnaire. Those here, we look forward to some uh, uh, feedback, uh, because this will make a difference as to how we're going to plan our program going forward. And finally, uh, I'd like to, uh, I hope you will uh, give us a hand, your hand. Um, I'm grateful to you for uh, staying for so long. I'm also grateful to all the guests who joined us today and all the staff um, on stage and backstage, uh, Ling Lam University, Hong Kong Art School, and also the streaming support and production, NOVA, 
and also uh, our traditional masters and the new generation masters and all the hundreds of um, secondary schools and students. Last but not least, we have to thank the Jockey Club um, Charities Trust. In order to achieve um, innovative heritage, we need uh, innovation. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the Art Center. Thank you all very much.